so thank you very much for everyone who joined this seminar series. This is the last seminar for the academic year. So we had a lot going on this year, as everyone knows. So we had to move for the first time uh, from face-to-face -face seminar to online, and it has been very successful. So very, uh, thank you very much for coming. And also thank you so much for Catherine, jo you agree to do it online. It's a bit awkward as a presenter, especially, but it will be great. Um, it's good to have you here. So um, the presenter today is the Catherine Staple Ford. Uh, she's my PhD student and then she's PhD candidate on the program called um, E-Research and Technology and Learning. She's from cohort 10 and she's uh, writing up her dissertation, which is we're going to listen to her uh, talking about her dissertation project in a minute or two. So her title of the presentation is Navigating the Distances of Online Learning, which is highly relevant topic to current situation, as you know. One way or the other, we're all students in the online setting or teachers in the online setting suddenly. So it will be particularly interesting to uh, hear about uh, what she found out by talking to many students who are in the online setting. So she's also an online teacher, so uh, I'm pretty sure that, uh, Catherine, you're going to talk about your experience um, mm -hmm. as a learner and teacher as well today. So please welcome Catherine. Um, and then while Catherine is presenting it, if you can all mute yourself, um, that will be great. And we'll, uh, I'll skip the part that everyone is going around and introducing themselves. That's what we, we usually do in face-to-face -face okay. setting, but we can at least see your name. So welcome everyone. It's good to see you and meet you all here online. All right, so shall we start the presentation? Catherine, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so yeah, this presentation is the story so far of my PhD thesis and I'm at the stage where I've finished data collection and analysis and I'm bringing it all together and writing up, although I'm still playing a little bit with data and themes and how best to structure and present them. So that's what I'll share with you today and I'm happy to expand on anything in questions at the end. And just to note that the images um, in this presentation are all Creative Commons Zero license, so no attribution is, is required. So I'm going to start with a brief story which illustrates the personal and professional motivation for my study. I've worked in online distance learning for about four years now. and I'm currently a lecturer in digital education at the University of Leeds, which is pictured here. And all my students are online distance learners, postgraduate online distance learners. And I'm based in the School of Education, which is housed in Hillary Place, which is here. And in the School of Education, we welcome a high proportion of international students. And so we work really hard to welcome students, to help them feel at home. Um, we put on a lot of social events throughout the year to build a sense of community, establish a sense of belonging among the students. And one of the events that's organized during induction week is an afternoon tea. And this is really nice event. Staff and students come together, start getting to know each other, and we have obviously eat delicious cakes and, and drink tea. Um, and during this event, I was talking to a colleague who'd organized it, and I said, well, it's a shame we don't have a similar way to welcome distance learners into the university, and wouldn't it be nice if we could think about how we might work on establishing that sense of belonging and community for distance learners? And her response was interesting, and she said, um, oh, well, they're very welcome to come along to these events if they want to. And I was a bit perplexed by that because Obviously, distance learners who are in Mexico, Malaysia, Namibia, or even Coventry, they're clearly not able to come along to Leeds for, for afternoon tea. And what this highlighted to me was a fundamental lack of awareness of who our distance learners actually are. And it's not just an individual kit, it's something that I do um, see quite often. People just don't get who distance learners are, and they tend to view them as part-time learners who can't come into campus because they're busy working. And they don't realize that that distance actually does mean quite a significant geographical distance for, for many of, of these learners. And so for me, this re represents a threshold concept, a fundamental misconception. And, and that's been a strong motivator um, for the focus of my thesis. 
And I've become kind of a champion of distance learners um, as a result of this. And so in, in this thesis, I wanted to sort of establish a, a deeper understanding of this concept of distance learners and, and their needs, their realities and their experiences. So that's the professional personal motivation behind the study. With regard to the research context, I'm not going into a lot of detail here. I'll just outline some general research trends in distance education research. So in a 2009 literature review, Olaf Zavaki Richter reviewed distance learning research between 2008, sorry, 2000 and 2008. And he identified three levels of distance learning research. So the macro level is concerned with systems and theories. The meso level is concerned with management, organization and technology. And the micro level is concerned with teaching and learning. And um, a major finding from this study was that the micro level far and above outweighs research in the other two areas. And this is perhaps, it's, it's understandable as data in this area is perhaps more easily accessible and it's perhaps more of a, an immediate concern to academics in the other two levels. So within that micro level, the three areas um, he identified were instructional design, interaction and communication, and learner characteristics. So in a later study, also by Zawaki Richter, this time with Somnado in 2016, they looked at a period, a longer period, 35 years of distance education research um, between 1980 and 2014. And they identified what they termed waves of alternating institutional and individual perspectives, where the institutional focuses on the meso level and the individual focuses on the micro level, so still not much research at the macro level. And what we can see here is that the micro level um, is concerned with the design of distance programs, supporting learners, so again learner characteristics, and more recently with the rise in interactive technologies, uh, significant focus has been on interaction and communication in online distance learning. So um, these studies of learner characteristics and interaction um, is where my focus is. Now, studies of learner characteristics tend often are, are quite reductionist and, and they focus on personality traits and, and skills and competencies that are associated with, in inverted commas, successful distance learners. So these are skills like independent learning, autonomy, self-regulation, et cetera. And this fo focus tends to be at the beginning of the learner's journey. So it, it's uh, looking at the baseline, uh, which then forms the, um, for which support mechanisms are put in place. So there's a bit of a deficit perspective here, um, and it's focusing on this separation of learner and academy. And, it's, and that separation has been linked to the higher dropout rate for distance learners. And so one way to bridge that separation, that divide and counter some of the dropout is a growing interest in interaction in distance learning. Um, and this research looks, often looks at interaction patterns and it often tries to quantify interaction and its impact on learning, particularly with regard to student satisfaction. And this is all within the context of the learning environment. And it tends to be often quite technology driven. So evaluating different types of communication technology in order to assess effectiveness. And it also has the agenda of identifying instructional or pedagogic strategies for maximizing interaction. And neither of these bodies of research really take into account learners' individual realities beyond the learning environment. So it has the effect of fragmenting individuals and concerns itself with learners rather than with people. So we have a situation where, as Lee says, um, the design of online learning environments is ultimately separate from the learner's real life environment. And this research is done, again, from the institutional perspective in order to improve the learner experience within the learning environment. And it doesn't take account of their social professional cultural context and obviously these contexts have a huge impact on on anyone's learning experience 
So what's needed then is more research um, into the psychological and social attributes of the learner, the construction of learner identity, and this is all talking about online learners, the experience and perspectives of online students, and that needs to go beyond their lives as students. So this is what my thesis attempts to do. I use the lens of interaction to investigate online distance learners' realities, not just as learners in a learning environment, but as people in a wider socio-cultural context. And so to operationalize this focus, I have two research questions. The first focuses on the interactions that online distance learners engage in within and beyond the learning environment and how these impact on their experience of that separation between themselves and the academy. Um, and then the second question is more conceptual. So I seek to challenge or problematize the theory of transactional distance. So that's part of my theoretical framework. And this question also speaks to Vaki Richter's call for more um, of the macro uh, level research into theories of distance learning. So um, on to my theoretical framework then. Um, it's comprised of three elements. Firstly, because I'm investigating the interactions that distance learners engage in and how they impact on their experience, I use a typology of interactions frame my data generation and analysis. Secondly, I use the theory of transactional distance, and that's a theory of distance learning, and I use that to analyze and interpret the data. And then as the theory of transactional distance is based on the theory of transactionalism, I use this theory to interpret and interrogate the data. So those are the three elements. I'll just say a bit more about each one. So the types of interaction then, um, in 1989, Michael Moore presented a typology of three types of interaction that's required for distance learning. And these are learner content, learner teacher, and learner learner. And various studies have been done looking at either one or all of these types of interaction to try to identify which one is the most important but really there's no consensus there. And, and what Michael Moore said was that each of these are important and they should all feature in the learning experience. So later on in line with advances in digital technology, the interaction between learner and technology was added to Moore's three types. Um, now, this could be considered as a mediator of the other three types of interaction rather than a type in its own right, because in distance learning, all interactions happen with some sort of mediating technology. And that's true, but I found in my studies that learners do interact with technology in itself as a resource or as a learning tool, as well as, as a mediator for the other types of interaction. So I would um, consider it a fourth type. And more recently, again, um, a further type was added that between learner and context, and by that they mean social cultural context. And again, this could be seen as a mediator, because all our interactions are mediated by our social cultural context. But I've included it as an additional type, because again, in my study, I found that particularly the professional context was a really important type of interaction for, for the participant. And then I also identified a sixth type of interaction. Um, and I think that that underpins all of these. And that's the interaction between the learner and the self. So a reflective or metacognitive type of interaction. And again, we could say that this is a mediator of all the other types. But I saw that that reflection or metacognition or the process of learning and developing as a scholar was very important type of interaction for some, well, most of my participants. So that's the first element of the theoretical framework. The second element is, the, um, is also from Michael Moore and is his theory of transactional distance. And that is based on the premise that distance learning is characterized by the separation of teacher and learner. And that's the fundamental defining characteristic of distance learning in, according to Moore and many others. And so this separation or transactional distance, it's not only a physical, um, but it's also a psychological separation. 
and it can lead to a communications gap or as he puts it a space of mat potential misunderstanding so the greater the transactional distance the more potential misunderstanding there'll be and this has led online course designers and instructors to endeavor to reduce that transactional distance and more identified that this Space or gap of misunderstandings requires certain types of pedagogical behaviors. And these are dialogue, and by which he means um, instructional dialogue aimed at supporting and advancing the understanding of the learner. Structure, and that's the degree of flexibility built into a program. And then autonomy, which refers to the ability of learners to be independent. And these behaviours are interrelated. So the more rigidly structured a programme is, the less opportunity for dialogue and the more autonomy is required of the students. So according to this theory, distance learning programmes, particularly at the time of Moore's writing here, um, were more suited to autonomous learners. Now, there are some limitations to this theory. Um, First of all, it's quite teacher-centric or academy-centric. By academy, I'm referring to the institution, the resources, um, the instructors, etc. Um, so it's, it's teacher-centric. So the, the dialogue that he talks about is instructional dialogue. The structure is that decided by the academy and the autonomy is that required by the structure. So it's very much from the perspective of an institution. So it's about distance learning programs really rather than distance learners. Also, it's a pre-digital theory, so it doesn't take account of technologies that allow much more ease of communication and also communication between learners. So that's perhaps one of the reasons why it's more teacher-centric. It's quite singular in its interpretation of dialogue and structure and autonomy. They're seen as one dimensional phenomena, whereas my data suggested a more complex, multifaceted interpretation. And finally, I would argue that again, it's based on this deficit perspective. So it's premised on the separation that leads to problems in understanding. And so distance learning is essentially a problem to be solved. And again, this is perhaps due to the fact that it's pre-digital, but despite its age, it's still a very popular theory and is often used in um, studies of distance learning programs. So that's the second dimension of the theoretical framework. Finally, the third element of the theoretical framework is transactionalism. And that was the theory proposed by John Dewey, along with Arthur Bentwick. And a key concept of transactionalism is the distinction between interaction and transaction. Now, Dewey saw interaction as dualistic, where one element has an impact on another. So for example, the learning material might have an impact on the learner, and that's a unidirectional action. Whereas for transaction, that's a non-dualist process or experience. So in, for this, the learning material, it's not seen as neutral or static or objective. It self-alters according to the learner, time, the social-cultural background, the state of mind, etc. So transaction is multidirectional. It's mutual and reciprocal, and it's an act of experiencing in which the different aspects of that transaction can't easily be separated from each other. And this element of the theoretical framework became more prominent during my analysis and interpretation when I started to look more deeply at transactional distance. And it helped to explain and help me to understand the participants' experiences and interactions more deeply. And it preserved the complexity of their experience, I felt. So um, that's theoretical framework. I'll now talk a little bit about my research design. So given that the aim of my research is to gain a deeper understanding of um, online distance learners' lived experiences, I first need to acknowledge that any individual's lived experience or reality will not only be different from any other individual's, but will also vary for that individual over time and in different physical, psychological contexts. 
And also, um, my focus is on the interactions which learners experience and the fact that these interactions have the potential to alter the learner's reality and vice versa. And again, so this goes back to the um, non-dualist ontology of transactionalism. And so I became, uh, I started to prefer the term transaction over interaction because transaction, as Rosenblatt says, um, it asserts the non-neutrality of a stimulus when perceived by an individual. So the lived experience that I'm attempting to capture and understand can only ever be a snapshot of a single reality at a particular time and place. And so this reflects the anti-foundationalist belief that reality is socially and discursively constructed by human actors. And that's Grix 2004. And also it's in a constant state of revision. That's Bryman 2001. So it's, um, it's not constant, consistent and static or independent, which is the foundationalist perspective. So as I wanted to gain insights into learners' lived experiences, I needed deep and rich qualitative data. So I used narrative inquiry and photo elicitation to generate this qualitative data. Um, so narrative inquiry is useful because, well, it's said that we are storied beings and that we make meaning of our lives and experiences through, through the telling of our stories. And that's Con Connolly and Clandon in 1990. And stories are co-constructed between the teller and the audience or the listener. And that's Kim 2016. And it was my intention to, to take the part of the audience and help the participants construct their stories in order to shed light on their realities. And this co-construction was quite an important part of my study. Um, and also, as Bruner in 2004 claims, a life is not how it was, but how it's interpreted and reinterpreted, how it's told and retold. And so narrative is fundamentally an interpretivist or anti-foundationalist approach. Um, photo elicitation um, was useful. Um, photos and images it said can produce a richer account than verbal in interview data alone. Um, that's Margulis and Powell's 2011, Stanjak 2007 and Collier 1957. And Collier 1957 also said that a photograph is a restatement of reality. It presents life around us in new objective and arresting dimensions and it can stimulate the informant to discuss the world about him, his words, as if observing it for the first time. And Collier also said it can create a more naturalistic setting and relaxed encounter than in a direct interview situation. And again, this was particularly important for me. I was conducting interviews over Skype. And um, so yeah, establishing this rapport um, was an important aspect of that. Um, I'll briefly skip over the next slide. I can come back to it later if people are interested. These are the participants, uh, 12 postgraduate online distance learners studying a range of master's programmes at a range of institutions, um, all UK institutions, but the students themselves were based all around the world. So the process of data generation then, well, as I said, I, I conducted interviews via Skype mostly or some other um, virtual meeting platform. And I conducted three interviews with each participant. Although I kind of prefer to call these um, discussions really because they consisted mostly of sharing experiences. It wasn't a typical researcher participant question response sort of structure. I did have some prompts that I wanted to ask about, but largely the discussions were led by the participants. So in the first discussion, um, we looked at participants' programmes, their motivations, the sorts of interactions they engaged in, and their overall impressions of the distance learning experience. And also in this interview, I gave instructions for the um, sharing of photos or images. 
And this became quite a loose um, interpretation of photo elicitation. It might perhaps be better described as artifact elicitation because students shared with me some photos and um, some screenshots, some shared documents with me, and one participant used her webcam to show me around her flat, which had all her assistive technology there. Um, so it put it in essence, it was some sort of visual prompt um, that told me that re represented something about their experience as an online distance learner. And those artifacts or images formed the basis of the second interview. But in between the first and second interviews, I conducted some preliminary analysis. So I coded the transcripts um, according to research questions and theoretical frameworks. I produced concept maps for each participant, and I also wrote participant profiles. And then before the second interview, I shared the profiles with the participants and they uploaded the images or artifacts. So the second interviews um, consisted of us, first of all, looking at the profiles, and participants offered corrections, amendments, and additions, further reflections on what I'd written. And we then moved on to focus on the image or artifact that, that they had uploaded. And I just invited participants to talk to these artifacts, and I followed up with further questions. And that led on to some really interesting discussions and generated um, some, some really rich data. And then after the second interview, I again continued to code. But by this stage, I felt like the coding was fragmenting the individuals. Um, and that's really not what I wanted to do. It was quite important for me to retain them as complete people. And I, so I wanted to find a way to keep them whole. And actually what I really wanted to do was to produce 12 in-depth case studies, but obviously that wouldn't have been feasible in, in the word count. So instead, I identified for each participant two, well, usually three, really strong ideas or themes or, or voices that had come through the discussion so far. And then I looked in the data and extracted brief episodes from their interviews that illustrated these themes or ideas. And this reflects the critical events analysis that's outlined by Webster and Matova, 2007. So these episodes that I term meaningful episodes formed the data set. And then on those, I conducted more in-depth analysis. And I'll talk about how I did that in the next slide. So prior to interview three, I did that in-depth analysis and shared it with participants. And the third interview was mainly based around us discussing those um, analyses. And again, participants offering corrections, amendments, and further interpretations and reflections on them. Okay, so um, I'll just talk now about this particular method I used for my final in-depth analysis of those meaningful episodes. And that's a technique called the listening guide. And it was devised by Brown and Gilligan in 1992. And the, the listening guide is a voice-centered relational method. And what that means is it focuses on the participants' voices and the way they use voice to position themselves in relation to other elements of the narrative. So the other elements might be other people, objects, um, events, etc. So it's quite a systematic method in that you're required to read, sorry, I'll just go back. You're required to read or listen to the transcripts at least four times and each time you have a different focus. So this is an image of one of these um, analyses that I did. So in the center is the meaningful episode that I identified for the participant. And then around the outside are the different focuses or lenses through which I read or listened to the episode. So the first listening is for plot. And this is where you identify key events, characters, ideas, and also you note know your own response to that. So it's kind of um, a retelling of the original um, episode. The second listening produces what's called an I poem. And this is where you underline or highlight the verb phrases where the participant talks about themselves, where they use the word I. And I also highlighted where they use different subjects. 
and then you write them all down um, in the form of a poem. So that's what's running along the bottom there. Um, and I also separated out the poems into stanzas um, that helped me identify the different steps or the, um, the structure of the narrative. And then in the blue writing um, is a reflection on the I poem, so an, a further retelling. And I found the I poem a really powerful technique because it enabled me to really see how the participants viewed themselves in relation to other characters or events in, in, in the narrative and, and the extent to which they identified with those other elements or perhaps not. And um, I think that it's, it's so powerful because it, it takes the focus away from what is said to how it is said. Um, and then, so the remaining listenings, you can do as many as you want, but for me, I did three more listenings and these were particularly focused on my research um, questions. Uh, first, I listened for language and vocabulary. I felt that that gave me some quite useful insights into the perspectives. The fourth listening, I look through the lens of transactional distance. I try to identify whether that was high or low and also the balance of dialogue structure and autonomy. And the final listening was through the lens of types of interaction. So this then produced um, one of these analysis sheets. And so there are about two or three of those for each participant. And I wrote those up into narratives of they varied between 300 to 800 words each. Um, and that's what I shared with the participants prior to the third interview. And also during the third interview, I, I showed them these analysis sheets um, just to explain how I'd got from their narrative to my retelling. Okay, so um, I'll now go on to present some of my findings. Uh, according to my two research questions. So I'll look at the interactions or transactions that my participants engaged in and how these impacted on the learning experience and also what they tell us about transactional distance. So this has been really difficult part for me to um, select just one or two extracts. Obviously, I can only, because of the time restrictions here, um, I can only choose very few extracts um, to illustrate the themes. There's many, many more examples in the data. But anyway, um, so my analysis um, identified three broad themes and they were transactions around um, control, being in control. Those transactions that were sustaining or nourishing and I chose those words because I wanted to avoid the deficit word of support because that doesn't reflect the participants and they definitely weren't approaching the learning from a deficit. And then the third theme is um, authentic or applied transactions. So um, control then. So control means different things for different people. And um, in this episode from Abigail, these are all pseudonyms, um, we see that control means having a choice. So um, we see Abigail here describing a transaction in which she and her peers were given study buddies. They were assigned study buddies. And she talks about how this didn't work for her because there was no synergy between her and the buddy she'd been assigned. So she actively sought out some other people to buddy up with, and she felt that that worked a lot better. However, um, the instructors weren't particularly happy about it and, and they were reminded that they should actually have stuck with their assigned buddy. So we can see that this um, transaction, um, it's very much a transaction in the Dewean sense. All the aspects are interrelating and the effects are mutual and reciprocal. So the program structure, the buddy system, the buddies, the troublemakers, that's Abigail's words, um, are all engaged in this mutually impactful process or, or experience. So it's more complex than an interaction. And then with regard to transactional distance, this episode highlights how the program structure, the inflexibility of it, actually prevented Abigail 
and her peers from exercising agency or autonomy. So in this example, Abigail and her peers, they were able to overrule or go against the structure. They went the wrong way, exercised their agency, took control, and they created for themselves a more productive learning experience. And as she says, in the end, it all worked. But what this shows is, in a way, it's the opposite of what Moore proposed in his claim that highly structured programs suit autonomous learners. We can see it's the opposite here. The structure actually prevented or constrained them, uh, their autonomy. Um, okay, so the next narrative is from Fred, and this um, illustrates how control can mean being true to yourself. And in this episode, he describes his experience of discussion forums, and that led to a situation where he was not able to be true to himself. So just some background about Fred. He enrolled on his distance learning program, not for a qualification, because he's already got a doctorate. He's highly experienced in his field. In his own words, he said, I just want to talk to people about this stuff. So he really craves critical dialogue. And because of his deep interest in the topic and the fact that he's immersed in it professionally meant that he produced quite long discussion posts. And there wasn't much engagement from his co-learners. And in fact, his tutors recommended that he, he tone it down, that he rein it in a bit. And this ultimately resulted in it, him feeling constrained. After this incident, he didn't feel he was able to engage in the way that he wanted to. He felt that he had to take a step back so as not to overpower people. And there's a feeling of disappointment in this narrative. He accepts it, um, but it's not quite what he wanted from the course. So he's not really in control and he's not able to be true to himself. So in this episode, we can see that Fred is engaged in a transactional process involving his own interest, his motivations, his prior experience, his professional context, co-learners, tutors, and the program structure. So it, again, it's quite a complex interrelationship of all these aspects which have an influence on each other. And this episode can also tell us something about transactional distance. So if we remember Moore, Michael Moore said that autonomous learners require less supportive or instructional dialogue. And what we see here is that Fred, who is a highly autonomous individual, he certainly doesn't require instructional or supportive dialogue. However, he absolutely craves critical, constructive dialogue with his peers and tutors, a more egalitarian form of dialogue. And, and this suggests that dialogue has more than an instructional function. And also, again, the program structure, which according to Moore suits autonomous learners, actually functions to present, prevent um, Fred's autonomy in terms of being true to himself. So that's um, a couple of examples of the theme of control. The next theme is authenticity. And um, we can see here that authenticity is achieved or can be achieved through social relevance. So Chetner here describes how as a result of her learning, she feels more engaged in her own social political context. And it's almost as if she's a part to play in that now. And so we can see that the transaction where local events and policies are no longer neutral or irrelevant for her like they used to be. As a result of her learning experience, um, those events, that context has taken on a new relevance for her. So this is another illustration of the, the non-dualism of transactionalism. And also what it suggests is that the social context can provide a forum which facilitates the understanding and the application of learning and so that could be said to mitigate transactional distance somewhat the separation of learner and academy so the social relevance perhaps here makes up for the transactional distance as perhaps an alternative form of transactional proximity we might call it um, that counters that, that distance of, of distance learning. Um, in this episode from Roseanne, we see that for some participants, in order to have an authentic experience, they have 
to actively reify their learning. So Roseanne here describes how she seeks out conferences, which she feels brings her learning to life and makes it more concrete, makes it more interesting. And in this transaction, we see how Roseanne's engagement with the learning content changes it from being a dry educational material to being, as she says, elsewhere, unbelievably interesting by moving it from one context to another, a more authentic context, her learning is, is enhanced. And again, so we see the, the non-neutrality of the stimulus here, which is altered. There's nothing different about that learning material um, except that Roseanne has placed it in a different context. Okay, so that's the theme of authenticity. The third theme then um, is nourishment, transactions of nourishment or sustenance. So in this narrative, um, we see how Sasha describes how he likes to travel as a distraction or have a, a break from studying. And that gives him mental well-being to come back refreshed and approach his work from a position of strength. And this is another non-dualist transaction where the learning or stimulus is changed due to the altered psychological state of the individual Sasha when he comes back from his break. Um, so these types of transactions, they're not accounted for in the typologies of interaction we saw earlier and the, that was initially proposed by Moore, or the, they're not accounted for in his theory of transactional distance either. And what it highlights to me is that some of these theories, that they fragment the individuals and they overemphasize one aspect of them. And in this case, it's overemphasizing the learning aspect. Um, another um, form of nourishment can be intellectual nourishment. So um, in Roseanne's narrative here, um, illustrates the importance of that, the intellectual nourishment. So as with Fred, Roseanne's not just studying for a qualification. For her, it's a life choice. It's about stimulating her intellect. It's a, a life enhancing process. And this is a really strong theme for her that runs throughout all of our three discussions. And she just derives joy from studying and learning. And it's become a really important part of her life and, and she intends to continue that for the rest of her life. It's a lifelong process. And so the non-duality of the transaction here is particularly illustrated quite effectively if we contrast this with the next episode from Marianne. So Roseanne and Marianne are both studying on the same program, um, but they have completely different perspectives and experiences. And so it tells us that the, the program content is, is far from neutral. So for Roseanne, it's a joy, whereas for Marianne, it's, it's a source of stress. And she talks about it almost as if it's a burden. And that's added to by the lack of nourishment that she gets from her professional context. So in this episode, she's describing how her colleagues, they don't really care. Um, about her studying. They view it as something that's quite separate and irrelevant for her clinical work. Um, and they, they view that clinical work as what's important. So she, when she becomes stressed um, due to exams and pressures of work, she's, she doesn't get that nourishment or sustenance from a professional context. So again, this highlights the non-duality of a transaction where the object, so the learning, is not neutral, it changes, according to the positionality of the individual who's experiencing it. And also, if we look at Roseanne's and Marion's experiences through the lens of transactional distance, we can see how for Roseanne, the joy and life enhancement that she gets from her learning more than makes up for that separation, the distance between her and the academy. Whereas for Marion, there's definitely a, a quite a strong disconnect uh, between her life and work and her study. That's very briefly um, some of the, the major findings. So just to try and bring that together um, in conclusion. So firstly, um, the transactions that um, are engaged in by the online distance learners in my study suggest that the wider social cultural context plays an important role in enhancing their learning experience. And 
by engaging in authentic transactions beyond the learning environment that can perhaps compensate for the distance or separation between learner and the academy. And with regard to the second research question, uh, which sought to challenge transactional distance, the data from my study indicates that those three elements of transactional distance and how they interrelate are a lot more complex than more originally suggested. Um, so I identified that dialogue can, can consist of instructivist as well as constructivist dialogue. Structure can be constraining as well as enabling and autonomy can refer to that that's required to be self-efficient or that that's allowed to be able to exercise agency. So that's the story so far. Um, those, sorry, that's very small, <laughs> some of the references that I've cited in the presentation. So thank you very much for listening um, and I look forward to any questions you've got. Thank you very much. Uh, lovely. Um, it's great to have a very structured overview and um, knowing where you are, Catherine, personally, um, as a person working with you. Um, so the now we can have questions. I think the number is just right for me to possibly give the opportunity for actually people to ask questions by themselves. It's 30, so let's just assume that everyone can have their voice heard. Um, so rather than using chat, or you can still kind of a, type your question on chat, and if you want, I'll give you kind of mic, so those people having question can actually ask question in person. Is that all right? Shall we try in that way, unless we are bombarded by all the questions? So I'll give uh, everyone probably a couple minutes to think about the question and put um, put the question. I and mean, we have thanks messages. Yeah, it was very informative and enjoyable presentation from Chris and Jane. Um, yeah, just let's kind of while we're kind of giving some time to people i mean i can i can take advantage of me being a chair to ask question <laughs> so one of the things that um i mean i know your study catherine uh, mm. but one of the things that you did really well is about the photo part mm. uh, so i supervised a couple of other students doing this trying to use similar methodology as a data collection method, mm -hmm. but some actually find it very difficult to get any meaningful photos from participants. So she was basically saying, everyone just giving me the photo of um, their laptop. So, it's yeah. kind of, <laughs> so for her, it was very difficult to get anything very meaningful out of it. So I'm just wondering yeah. because you used it really well. So if you can share a little bit about what kind of, what kind of photo actually people sent to you and how mm -hmm. you actually use them to guide yeah. dialogue that will be useful yeah i did i did get the laptop i got um it it, it was there was such a, a variation of of what people shared with me um from um two photographs just a different angle of the laptop and that was really hard to then get something from and i had to work quite hard to prompt that i think it's even though I've, I felt that I put a lot of effort at the beginning in explaining this and trying to um, really make it clear that it was entirely up to them what they uh, wanted to share. It wasn't so much the photo, but what it said about their experience. I think still for some people that didn't really get, get across. Um, so yeah, it's, if you do get those very limiting photos that don't say much, then it's much harder work to prompt and, and really work around those and in that situation I saw there was a textbook nearby I saw that it was in a, a professional environment so I asked questions about those things and that allowed us to then uh, move on and then um, some students showed shared quite um, intimate um, photographs of, of, of their life so um, one one person shared the photograph of her baptism because her faith was a really strong aspect of her studying um, and I felt quite almost intrusive uh, and, and privileged as well because these are 
personal private things that, that they shared and it's it, so it does depend quite a lot on how that's interpreted by the participants um and then as i say one one student actually didn't didn't share anything and that's just because she just didn't have time it came to the second interview and she still hadn't shared anything so we, we just had more of a discussion and another student who who is disabled and so her setup in her home is full of assistive technology and that is basically what she showed me so she put her webcam the other way around and, and wheeled around her flat and, 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 and we talked about all these things that she uses and how it impacts on her. Um, so that's a, quite a good example of, of yeah, the range really. Some, and also the way that students talked about them. So some just said, oh, um, here's a screenshot of a discussion post that I did. Um, and we talked about that. Whereas another person shared lots of photographs that were views of out of his window or his walk to work and he used those as metaphors for his learning experience and and he was quite poetic in the way he talked about them um so yes yeah, so there's, there's no answer really i suppose it's trying to be clear at the beginning that it's not about the photo it's about what it says about the experience i suppose and perhaps to broaden it out because some people share documents as well so that's uh, that's good thank you so much that, i think that's a useful um recommendation for people who wanted to use the similar method so we have a few questions here uh we have shane from court nine as well hi shane do you want to uh speak up your own question if you don't mind you can turn on the uh microphone i can actually unmute you <laughs> All right. No, thanks. All right. <laughs> so, okay. The shame was asking about the part. Um, okay, let me just scroll it down up again a bit. Um, so the So the meaningful episodes, the way that you try mm. to um, analyze your data, you have the meaningful episode at the center. Mm. So uh, Shane's question was, is that part of your theoretical framework? What is the relationship between the way that you analyze and then the use of theoretical framework you have? Um, it's more of a technique, really. I wouldn't say it's part of my theoretical framework. I mean, it is it links to my theoretical framework because part of my theoretical framework is transactionalism and, and transactions as opposed to interactions and so these meaningful episodes represented a, a transact i could call them meaningful transactions and i might do that i don't know <laughs> um so they related to the theoretical framework in that that enabled me to look in more depth and analyze more more deeply and to identify my unit of analysis if, if you like um so yeah in that way it relates mm. Mm. all right that's a good uh, that's a good answer very clear um so we have maza here um yeah she nearly started her study on tell as well hi are you there you want to speak up your question or you're gonna say no thank you again hi uh, dr lee how are hi. you I'm very good. Good to see Hi, you. Hi, Catherine. Here. I enjoyed Hi. the the presentation really, and because you focused on distance learners, so my question is: Is there any advice that you want to give for a fresh PhD learner to cope with the all business and <laughs> you know uh, work life with the distance learning? Is there any piece of advice that can help us to? cope with this situation and thank you for your presentation i really uh, enjoyed it especially it uh, really address distance learners yeah mm. thank you yeah, well, yeah. yeah so it, it does help if you're immersed um you've got to become immersed really and i suppose you've just got to accept that it's going to take over your life so 
if I mean obviously what, what I found useful was that the study complemented my work. I work with distance learners and I, I found that really as I was talking to participants that really fed into my work. So it didn't feel like two separate things. So as with the example with Marianne, her work was so separate, she didn't have any interest from her colleagues and she was just on her own with it and it was kind of dismissed by her colleagues. So if you can enlist the help um, and I think uh, Kyung Mi's work as well on that double A community of practice, if you can find that relevance and that application and that support and sustenance um, in your professional context, I think that really helps. So I don't know how close your professional context is to, to the programme, I'm presuming uh, somewhat. Yeah. Actually, I am a principal and, you know, in K-12 system, this is something in you to bring distance learning as an approach, mm. uh, especially for young learners. So, uh -huh. yeah, it's a mm. different thing, but uh, because my background is education, so mm. there is a connection. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Catherine, for your answer. Thank you. My pleasure. Good. Um, good luck, Maza, with your study. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not too struggling there. Yeah, um, inshallah. Hopefully. <laughs> so we have Seva from Court 9 as well. Hi, Seva. Hi there. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing your experience and for sharing the voices of your participants. Um, <laughs> It's it's a very interesting topic, and I'm and I'm glad that you um, that you focused on it because as an international student myself, I do struggle in that, and it's nice to see our our voices heard. If I can include myself in that, um, I just wanted to say your uh, your data analysis seems to be like amazing and breathtaking. It's extensive, and it must have been exhausting. <laughs> I'm, I'm just guessing. How, how did you manage any tips or strategies, tools that you've utilized to keep you sane and try to get it done, right? Yeah, um, I, it's, in a way it's easy for me, uh, my, my position, I, I'm, I'm in an academic context, I work in a u university, a Russell Group University, I teach, I work with researchers in digital, digital education, so it's I've got that, those support structures around me, so I'm really lucky in that way. Family life as well is not very demanding, um, so I've got support in that way. I don't have children. Um, and then, um, actually, w when I did a lot of this analysis, um, by the time I'd got to the doing those sheets, I found that so absorbing and interesting. It didn't feel like a chore. The coding felt like a bit of a chore. At first it wasn't, and I was getting lots of insights and writing the analytic memos and doing lots of reflection, but then it, it got to, and that helped me, I think, it was a necessary step, um, but when it started becoming a chore and I just felt myself going, oh, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there, then I thought, well, what, what's the point of this? You know, where's that, where's Roseanne gone? Where's Fred gone? Um, and then, so by finding that other technique, it Sort of reinvigorated me really so I suppose it's remaining open and not just thinking that oh that's the technique I've chosen and I've got to stick with it perhaps it's okay to, to change a little bit or complement your, your toolbox as, as you go through um, and I did take some time out I, I had a week away on my own um, to just really focus on analysis um, so that was that was useful as well um, and just, um, I, I, I think, Sibba, are you not, are you from cohort 10, from our cohort as well? Yes, yes, you, yes, you're yes. quite visual. Yeah. <laughs> so colouring and, and devs as well from our cohort. Colouring and being creative and enjoying it, it doesn't have to be dry. Um, yeah, I just, yeah. Uh, have you used any programmes like the famous Envivo? What I, I did use Envivo, yeah. Um, I, I am keen on, on technological tools, um, and I was, and that did help me, um, as I say, in, in the first step. But then there came a point where it, I still use it now to help me organise things, um, less so as an analysis tool. Cause it, it just didn't, yeah, it just split everything up into different bits. Um, it didn't mm. keep them whole for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good luck with writing Thank and yourself. <laughs> Thank you, you too. <laughs> All right. Um, so is there anyone who wants to ask 
Uh, okay, Shane has another question, and I don't think that Shane, you're gonna talk it. So I'm gonna read the question. Um, see, so your idea of nourishment as a move forward from student support certainly a very attractive idea. Is this on? <laughs> is this your original concept? Perhaps I think that the, my main contribution to to knowledge is the um, sort of reconceptualization of transactional distance and that more nuanced um, view of, of the elements of it, as well as the the transactional um, processes that that students engaged in, rather than just this one dimensional interaction, that non duality. Um, and to be honest with you, as I said at the beginning, I'm still playing with these themes and I don't know, nourishment, sustenance kind of had that more positive um, enhancing connotation rather than, than support. Um, so I don't know, possibly. <laughs> I mean, I can tap on that uh, to ask another question. I mean, the if you can kind of elaborate a little bit about the problematic discourse uh, prevailing in this field, like the mm. deficit. Mm. So is, this is your intentional effort, as long as I understand that you mm. try to really push yourself to use positive terms to describe this experience mm. rather than like make it, it like yeah. it's not as good as face-to-face -face doctoral mm. studies so on. Mm. So do you want to see the, uh, do you want to explain a little bit more about the deficit discourses you came across, which was a bit, you know, what made you decide to be positive about it? Why? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, as, you, as you alluded to just then, um, at the beginning, um, well, at the beginning, well, the, the, there was a period, I think there's a, sh a shift happening now but a lot of distance learning research was done from that deficit in that it sought to always compare itself to face-to-face -face teaching. And it, it, there's this assumption that face-to-face -face teaching is the best, it's the gold standard, um, and anything else has to be as good at it as it um, and so there was a lot of comparative is it as good as oh yeah and and, and kind of trying always trying to prove itself coming from this sort of almost ha having a, what do they call it in golf a handicap um, of having to demonstrate parity with face-to-face -face. and that, as educators know there's terrible face-to-face -face teaching um, just as there's um, fabulous online teaching and what I have found as an online instructor and what I've heard other people say as well is that actually being an online instructor enhances the face-to-face -face teaching so it, it, again, there's another transaction um, and so but I, th there is a recognition now that that's not a useful perspective from which to approach distance learning research it needs to be researched and investigated in its own right um, not as in comparison with face-to-face -face, um, teaching so that's where we are moving towards um, so yeah and 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 that's definitely what I feel quite strongly that it, it shouldn't be compared to face-to-face -face. Um, why should it and who's to say face-to-face uh, -face is particularly good yeah, I, I totally agree with you, especially now at this mm. moment, we need that positivism a little bit. Yeah. All right, <laughs> so Shane asked, uh, last one, uh, how did you recruit the 12 participants? Oh, that's a good question. Mm, yeah, so I had various methods. I contacted um, colleagues who were involved in distance learning and asked them to share my call for participants with their students, put them on the community notice boards and things like that. I sent the call for participants out to various JISC mail lists that I'm a member of, um, Learning Development Network, um, what are the other ones? Um, a few online learning ones. And I think that's why I ended up with quite a lot of people on um, education related courses, because I'm on these education related um, JISC mail lists. So, but anyway, so that, that, that was fine. Um, and I, I put some calls out on Twitter and via Facebook groups as well. Oh no, LinkedIn groups. I didn't get anything from that. Um, 
yeah, so JISC mail, listservs, and personal contacts. Oh, and I also um, con went through universities offering distance learning courses, and con where there were contact people for those, contacted them and asked them to share my call to participants with their students. And some did, some said, oh, I need to check if that's okay. And one university was expecting me to go through their whole ethical process and so I said, oh, it's all right. <laughs> I won't bother, even though I'd obviously got ethics from, from Lancaster. But. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. So we have Dijon's uh, say, thank you, Catherine. That was interesting and well organized presentation. Thank you all for organizing. Um, so that was my question. And then Daniel's there. <laughs> hey, Daniel. Hi, yeah. Uh. Great. Uh, good to see you here. Hi. Hey. Nice to be here. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I mean, the question I put was, you know, whether you think, I, actually, I'll give a bit of context first. I, mean, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I, this, I'm now doing my second sort of online degree, and I'm, you know, when, I, when I'm involved in the whole learning technology world, I find that even in that world, I feel like the picture people have in their heads of a student is someone who's kind of between 18 and 25 and studying full time on campus. And if you're a distance learner, you're sort of an aberration from that, and you're, you know, it, like you put it really well like a problem to be solved um and the one exception being the open university really um but, mm. but otherwise i don't think universities have really got their heads around <laughs> what yeah. it's like um yeah. and and so I, you know so obviously the research you're doing is fantastic part of addressing that um and i'd be really interested in your perspective on whether you think the needle's changing i mean obviously with covid you know <laughs> that, that's a whole thing in itself mm. right um but, mm -hmm. but just just be interested in your thoughts on that well, sometimes I think it is it is shifting and sometimes I think it's not. And I think because I'm in this bubble of digital education, working with digital education researchers, doing my PhD, I kind of, yeah, when I come out of that bubble and I get those responses, like the, the anecdote I shared at the beginning, it kind of makes me think, oh, oh, we're still there. <laughs> <laughs> there's still no clue about what distance learning is and um yeah i think perhaps with covid it, i mean obviously what's happening with covid can't really be compared to um well planned intentional distance learning courses it's an emergency response um but i think what it's doing is perhaps opening people's eyes to some of those um issues that that you know ha that people have to deal with and perhaps it will there might be a, a bit of a, a bigger step um as a result of this we'll see but yeah it does shock me still that there is such a lack of um awareness yeah so there's one i'm just so up on that one thing with covid is that you know events like this are being held online you know as opposed to it being a face-to-face -face event with you know, with a camera there. And mm. in some ways for online students, there are some really good side effects of COVID. Not so much, like you say, the teaching is sometimes a bit sort of rushed, but um, mm. but in terms of the number of events and things that are being held online, that's, yes. that's been, you know, huge, hugely increased. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It does make it more accessible in that sense. Yeah. Although, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, if you have more questions, feel free to type it. Um, so, I mean, I would, since it's kind of funny that I think I can see a lot of familiar names and many of our TEL students are actually here. So, probably I may just ask you, Catherine, to use this kind of new, you know, the, uh, let's say enhanced theoretical framework. If you try to look into your own learning experience on this program, no pressure you don't have to say any good things about it but uh because i you just had a really good new concepts so if you try to conceptualize conceptualize your own you know tell experience on this program using those notions how can you do it how was it so far how has it been <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i i've i've loved it and i'm, I'm still loving it um obviously i want it to be over but <laughs> not, not in a bad way. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think I, I just, I'm quite um, an intense learner in that I was so excited to start the program, and I, you know, I, I put everything into it, and I, 
and that's what I, I'm, I'm quite a, a SWOT, um, if you like. Um, so for me, it's just been fabulous. Um, and yeah, I love learning. And I think once you've got that bug for learning, you, you, um, like one of my participants, you just have, you can't not learn and, it, and it, it's fulfilling and it's interesting. I mean, obviously there have been highs and lows. After my first interview with my first participant, I felt quite um, despondent because I thought, oh, this is awful. She hasn't said anything interesting at all. <laughs> um, but obviously that, um, it's not up to her to say interesting things. It's up to me to, um, you know, the way it's analysed and, and related to the theoretical framework. And I think as well, at first I felt that I didn't own it. When I, I wanted to get my um, confirmation um, done with, and that felt like a bit, not jumping through hoops, but that was like, right now that's done with, now let's get on with the real research. And the, the owning of it, um, it has been a process and I do feel like I own it now. I was doubting myself and doubting things um, perhaps up to a few, maybe a, a year, about a year ago, a few months ago. And I think actually what's been really helpful and what I definitely advise people to do is this or some sort of presentation of it all because it really helps to bring it together and and because you never really look at it or talk about it or when we discuss together can we in our supervisions we look at one bit don't we? we we don't really put it all together and verbalizing it as well is so different from having it in your head and writing it down um, and I think that's that's really helped me to um, move forward yeah take a step forward so I don't know if that answered your question <laughs> I, I, I share in comments certainty, all, all those things yeah <laughs> I mean, Shane was conform. Shane conformed that it was a difficult question. So no, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the part that at this presentation, actually, I learned a lot about your study, Catherine. I thought I knew it all, but actually, yeah. it's very nice to be having it very structured way. Mm. And it's, I think, you're ready to go and just write and complete this journey. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, all right. So I think. Um, See, uh, we do not have more question, uh, looks like. Um, so maybe we can slowly close it, close it up if it's all right with you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. But it means that like, I mean, anything that, I mean, everything you presented was very clear. So it doesn't really create <laughs> much of uh, fuzziness, I guess that's why. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for everyone to come in. I wanted to unmute everyone so we can kind of voice up, use our voice to think um, and say thank you to Catherine. So that I'm going to do it for a second. And again, uh, this is our last seminar. Uh, for the academic year. So we are in the middle of conversation next year. We don't know what's going to happen. The seminar can be online like this way, or it can be at a certain point, we may go back to the face-to-face -face classroom. Um, but we'll announce those um, in due course once uh, the decisions are made. Um, this video will be available on our YouTube channel. So for those who could only come today, can enjoy watching it later. So by saying that thing, I'm closing it officially, but I will mute everyone now. So if everyone can say, think, am I unmuting it? Yeah, uh, you are. So I don't know how to do it actually, I'm trying to do it, but <laughs> if everyone can unmute yourself and say thank you to um, Catherine and our colleague and friend, that will be great. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. 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 <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, we do have a YouTube link, um, which uh, can we can circulate. So, Rose, if you uh, if you are part of the department emailing list, we can circulate that channel web link. If not, just send us the email. We can direct you to the channel. All right. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. So Ross, there is it.
All right, we can just wait, Catherine. Uh, so recording can stop at a certain point. And Catherine, you can stay here a little bit for a couple more minutes with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs>